the pleasure and the immense joy. And on behalf of my wife, the standing committee, and the clergy and their families and all the faith in the dust of Matabele. I warmly welcome the articulates who are coming all the way from the United Kingdom. We have Venerable Simon Gates. We have Venerable John King. These articles are coming from the Diocese of Sala and to be precise from Kingston Episcopal area where Bishop Marty Gainsborough is the Bishop of the area. Church was completed. The 
Hilda, George Nicholson, quarried the beautiful stone which makes up this cathedral from Sipazipaz, every block being shaped in situ at the quarry. He allowed no personal profit on his coat of 17,000 pounds. He may have been out of pocket though, since he had to break a strike of woodmen by importing masons from Cumberland. The architecture is of northern style, with its rounded arcs, which is quite like the Gothic, and it points us to heaven. You will notice that we start off on low ground in the street, and as we enter the gate, we rise a little. And as we enter the cathedral, we take in the most steps and rise some more. Going up the chancel, we rise even higher until we get to the sanctuary. And that is the highest point on which we can stand. But however, our eyes and our hearts are still drawn upward toward heaven. Our spire or flesh is of French origin and it symbolizes prayer. The object, therefore, of the cathedral is to worship and to pray. And so we come together this evening as we celebrate 70 years as a diocese in thanksgiving and rededication. Our evening song, Worship, uses the Book of Common Prayer which is commonly called even song, a combination of vespers and complete night prayer, devised by Thomas Cranmer and intended to be sung. Even song is a unique product of the English church. The service provides a framework in which scripture is read and explored. Readings from the Bible are therefore supported with psalms, canticles, and prayer. The music we hear, whether sung by all or on our behalf by the choir, is offered to God and gives us space to make this worship our own. Therefore, my dear sisters and brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, and since we have a great high priest, over the house of God. Let us draw near to God with sincere hearts in full assurance of faith. And necessary, as well for the body as the 
Father, of the Lord Jesus Christ, who desired not to be dead from the sinner, but rather that he may turn from and has given power and confidence for the wind to command him to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his living benefit the absolution and condition of their sins. He pardoned and avoided all the time that truly repent and that finished to leave his holy cross. Wherefore, let us beseech you to grant us true repentance and this Holy Spirit, that those things may be which we do in this present, and that the rest of our life may after be true and holy, so that the last we may come to his eternal glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. against it to 
said, Go number Israel and Judah. For the king said to Job, the captain of, captain of the army who was with him, Go now through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, and number the people, so that I may know the number of the people. And Job said to the king, Now may the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as they are, while the eyes of the Lord my king still see. But why does my Lord the king delight in this thing? Notwithstanding the king's word, prevailed against Job and against the captains of the army. And Job and the captains of the army went out from the presence of the king in order to number the people of Israel. And they passed over Jordan and camped in a row on the right side of the city that lies in the midst of the river of Gad and towards Jezreel. Then they came to Gilead and to the land of Tahim Hotshi. And they came to Dajan and around to Sidon. And they came to the stronghold of Tyre and to all the city of the Hivites and of the Canaanites. And they went out to the south of Judah, even to Beersheba. So when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days. And Joab gave up the sum of the number of people to the king. And there were in Israel eight hundred thousand valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were five hundred thousand. And David's heart was troubled as he numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. And now I beseech you, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. And when David rose up in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David seared, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, I offer three things. Choose one of them, so I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him and said to him, Will seven years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your enemies while they pursue you? Or will there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and see what answer I will return to you who sent me. And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us not fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. And let not one fall into the hand of men. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed. And then died of the people from Dan, even to Bersheba, 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand on Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented. From the calamity and said to the angel who destroyed the people, It is enough. Hold back now your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing place of Arna the Jebusite. And David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who smote the people and said, No, I have sinned and I have done wickedness. But be she, what have they done? Let your hand, I ask you, be against me and against my father's house. <coughs> and Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up and erect an altar to the Lord in the threshing.
threshing floor of Aranad the Jebusite and David. According to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. Now, now Aranad looked <coughs> and saw the king and his servants coming toward him. And Aranad went out and bowed himself before the king on his face, facing the ground. And Aranad said, why has the Lord King come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord, so that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. And Aaron has said to David, Let my Lord the King take and offer up what, he, what seems good to you. Behold, here are oxen for burnt sacrifice, and threshing instruments and other instruments of oxen for wood. All these, O king, Arana has given to the king. And Arana said to the king, The Lord your God accepts you. And now the king said to Arana, No, I will surely mind from you at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, for that which did not cost me anything. So David bought the threshing floor and oxen for fifty shekels of silver. And David built an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was moved by prayer for the land. And the plague was withdrawn from Israel. Here ended the first lesson. <coughs>
We also look forward to eager eyes to the future. We pray that you will continue to make your love known among us. Give us a zeal for mission. Help us to look beyond our boundaries to those who do not know you. Make this diocese a blessing to those around us and embolden us to move forward to spend toward what lies ahead. Eternal and loving God, today we give thanks to you for your goodness through all the years of worship and witness in this diocese of Matemene. We give you thanks for your grace in calling us to be your people, for your love revealed to us in Christ your Son, for your gift of the Spirit and the joy of salvation. We give thanks for those who established this diocese 70 years ago, and for the faith and vision, and for their gifts and ability. Give thanks to all who have been members of this diocese, those who have given freely of their time and money, and for those whose wisdom guided our diocese. We give thanks for all who have preached and taught here, for all who have confessed here that Jesus is Lord, and for all who today lead in worship, witness, and service in our diocese. God, from living and chosen stones, you prepare an everlasting dwelling place for your babies. Grant that in the power of the Holy Spirit, those who serve you here may always be kept within your presence. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. We thank you, Lord, our God, for the faith and courage of those men and women who, from the days of the apostles, have preached the gospel of the living Christ and have built up your church in every land. We thank you for those who stood firm in the face of persecution and for those who brought the good news to Help us to realize that we are part of your great church universal. Keep us faithful in our trust and make us the agents of your kingdom in the world of our day, especially in this diocese. As we celebrate 70 years of ministry for the glory of your name. Amen. Lord, we want to remember at this time those who work for your glory and your kingdom, all be it in one of lands, those who have given their lives to you. We want to remember, Lord, the soul of your servant, Karaway Dogu, Bishop of Woolwich, who passed on recently. Pray, O oh Lord, that you may comfort his wife, Mosun, and his family, and the entire diocese in their house. May his soul rest in eternal peace, and the light of virtual shine upon him. O oh God, from whom all desires, all who counsels, all who does what's to proceed, give unto thy servants that peace the world in your kingdom, that both our hearts and minds may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of for the love of thy only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Grant the Lord that the word which we hear this day may so take root in our hearts that we, living in accordance with your holy will, may ever praise and magnify you. 
your glorious name, through Jesus Christ our Lord.
name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It's an absolute pleasure and delight to be here with you for this historic anniversary, my first time in Zimbabwe. Thank you, Mr. Tirpas, for your invitation and particularly for your invitation to preach. And I'd like to also send greetings from my diocesan bishop, Bishop Christopher, who, if there were enough hours in the day, I'm sure would love to be here as well. But it's fantastic to be with you. Some years ago, I came across a rather special poem by the French poet and politician Charles Peguy, who lived, if you don't know, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. He died at the outbreak of the First World War. It's a wonderful poem in which Charles Peguy imagines God's dream for us. He says, I, God, I myself will dream a dream within you. Good dreams come from me, you know. My dreams seem impossible, not too practical, not for the cautious man or woman, a little risky perhaps, a trifle brash. And the bit I really love, but from those who share my dreams, I ask a little patience, a little humour, some small courage and a listening heart, I will do the rest. And then lastly, he goes on, then they, that's us, will risk and wonder at their daring, run and marvel at their speed, build and stand in awe at the beauty of their building. I truly love those words, build and stand in awe at the beauty of their building. God's dream for us. I wonder what you dream what God's dream is for you. The church in this place, in this beautiful country that I've just started to see. And what God's dream is for us, this diocese, all those who've come together today. God has brought us together for a purpose, I'm sure. We just need to work out what that purpose is. Our Bible reading from the second book of Samuel, the last chapter, gives us a window onto King David's reign, right at the very end, shortly before his death. And things are not going very well. King David has had better times. Indeed, in some ways, he offers us the ideal of a wise and just ruler who cares for his people. But as time goes on, his human frailties, his weakness, begin to show, the most famous time being when he takes another man's wife and has her husband killed in battle. And what commentators have noticed surveying the whole of David's life is that when David remembers whose servant he is, God's servant, <coughs> sees all he has as gift, gift from God, things then go well for Israel. But when King David does not do this, when King David grabs power, uses it for his own ends, as his own private thing, when he forgets whose servant he is, things go badly for Israel. And this is the context, it's kind of where we seem to be in chapter 24. It's a little puzzling, that passage, as it seems as if God has put David up to conducting a census specifically of those of fighting age. But it's clearly the wrong thing to do. King David's advisers know this, see the reticence of Joab. But the king ignores him, ignores his advisers, and disaster strikes. God's judgment on David's sin in the form of a plague, a pestilence, and thousands die. Why exactly the census was the wrong thing to do is not clear. But the message is clear. When we remember whose servants we are, see all that we have as a gift from God, things go well. When we don't, when we grab power, things go badly. It's possible to distill a complementary message 
from our reading from Acts, Acts chapter 13, of what can be achieved of the incredible transforming power of the Gospel if we pay attention to, align ourselves with what God has in mind for us, God's dream for us, to recall that poem I read from. What do you dream? Notice that when Barnabas and Saul or Paul are sent out, their mission is from start to finish in tune with God's Holy Spirit. Praying and fasting, Paul and Barnabas are set apart by the Holy Spirit and they are unstoppable. Sergius Paulus, the Roman proconsul, wants to hear the word of God and the false prophet who goes by the name of Bar-Jesus, or Elmas, who tries to lead Sergius Paulus astray, doesn't stand a chance. As we heard, he was made blind. Such is the power of the early church. Such is the power of disciples of Jesus Christ if we align ourselves with God's Holy Spirit. And perhaps as the church today, we sometimes need to take a little more care a little more time to discern where the Holy Spirit is leading us, because then the scope for the church to be a transformative force for good in the world is without limit, will know no bounds. Remember whose servants we are. Align ourselves with God's Holy Spirit. I heard a story recently of a church which was struggling it had rather lost its way, had stopped believing in a God who acts, a God who dreams dreams with us. <coughs> Until one day something happened that turned everything on its head, helped them get back on track. A gift from God, we might say, a God who acts. A young man called Woz, W-O-Z, who had never been to church before, knocked on the door. He was mourning the death of his grandmother, to whom he was close. And the young man said this. He said, just before she died, my grandmother gave me three pieces of advice. One, look after your teeth. Two, save a little, save a little money. And three, find God. And was said, I can look after my teeth and I can try and save a little, but can you help me find God? Those assembled were a little startled. No one had asked them this so directly before. But the young man's arrival was just enough to kickstart them into action, to inject new life into the church, to help them reconnect with where God's Holy Spirit was calling them. And they agreed to wait with the young man for God to find him. And this was not a passive kind of waiting, but an active kind of waiting, where they lived life to the full, attended to what was in front of them, reconnected with the community as they waited for God to act. King David may not have proved to be the leader the people of Israel wanted, he proved to be a disappointment. But God's faithfulness to his people is not in question. And in time, as we know, in the form of Jesus, in the line of David, God sent his only son, whose kingdom is not of this world, to bring righteous rule to his people, to give us all hope. The God who acts to lead us to abundant life. God's dream for us. God says, I myself will dream a dream within you. Good dreams come from me, you know. You'll meet me often as you work in your friends who believe in you enough to lend their own hands, their own hearts to your building. There will be sun-filled days and sometimes it will rain. A little variety, both come from me. So come now, be content. It's my dream you dream, my house you build, my caring you witness, my love you share. And this is the heart of the matter. Amen.
challenge indeed, especially in the context of this our celebration, celebration. What will this diocese look like in the next seven years, then seven years? And who will be here at that time? Please lift up your hand. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bishop Matt, for this spiritual nourishment you have given us this evening. May I also take this opportunity to thank the organist and the choir. Earlier on, I introduced the choir and forgot to introduce the organist who is hiding behind the organ. Greatly, <laughs> thank you very much. May I once again take the opportunity to introduce the Right Reverend Eric and Mrs. Warner of the Diocese of Manika. And he is the current chairman of the Anglican Council. So I have to the dean for notices. 